Oh, cool. Awesome. All right, so thanks, Jack, for the introduction. So I'm going to be talking about Midas, um, which is the fertile based compiler that lies at the heart of FireSim. Um, this is the work of many students, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that this really began as the Strober project, which is driven by Dong Yu Kim. Um, so it wouldn't be a talk without some sort of reference to Moore's Law. Um, but, you know, while the cost scaling of Moore's Law is ending or has ended, the NRE certainly remains. And a big focus of the Adept Lab and the Aspire Lab before it at Cal was to try and make building SOCs more accessible for companies that aren't Google um, by attacking this NRE cost. And so I think we've achieved that to some extent with Chisel and Fertile. Um, and obviously, RISC V has made it easier to architect much of the SOC. However, there are still these challenges regarding validation, verification, and software development costs, which we're starting to direct more of our attention towards here at Cal. So in this very scientific plot, I've sort of uh, captured a bunch of common software simulation methodologies, or modalities, rather, and I've compared it to a silicon prototype. So on, X, on the x-axis, we have uh, the fidelity of the model increasing as we go right. On the uh, y-axis, we have its speed relative to silicon. And so really, one of, the key, one of the cruxes of the cost in validation and verification lies in the fact that there's this huge gap between uh, cheap software simulation technologies and the silicon prototype. Um, which means that if you don't have something in between, you have to wait for the silicon to come back to do real uh, performance validation and uh, verification. Of course, that's completely unacceptable in industry, so they rely on expensive hardware emulation techniques to do this pre-silicon validation and verification, or mostly verification. Um, and then to let their software teams start developing earlier, you build uh, FPGA prototypes, and hopefully you can use a single FPGA. In the worst case, you need to use multiple ones, um, but that lets your software team start earlier, and that cuts your time to market, and that's really important. In academia, generally people don't screw around with prototypes because they're really hard to build, um, and so we rely on sampling techniques, and we try to extract the most out of really software technologies that have no business uh, motivating very detailed design decisions. And so, Around 2005, at the uh, start of the multi-core era, uh, a bunch of computer architects from a bunch of key universities around America came together and said, well, maybe we can come up with some way to use FPGAs as simulation accelerators uh, and make them more flexible tools for research. And that was the RAMP project. Um, and where Midas slots into all this is that it's trying to build on the work of RAMP, but trying to do so in, an, in a more programmatic and automated way. So what do I mean by FPGA accelerated simulation? Like what makes a ramp style simulator different than an FPGA prototype? Um, and at its core, it amounts to not simply synthesizing the ASIC RTL into LUTs, but rather decoupling um, the execution of the simulator from that of the, of the uh, host FPGA. So I think I'm gonna highlight three FPGA, uh, three limitations of conventional FPGA prototypes that ramp tried to address. Um, to varying degrees. The first is, if you take an ASIC design and you synthesize it to an FPGA, it doesn't, it's not natively non-deterministic, and you need to pull some tricks to model IO and DRAM properly. Um, so for instance, if you take, say, rocket chip and you tape it out, maybe you close timing at a gigahertz. If you take the same RTL and you synthesize it into LUTs, maybe it only closes timing at 100 megahertz. But the DRAM subsystem on your target and on the host FPGA might be of similar uh, speed And so the result is your prototype, unless again you perform some sort of trick, um, is going to see a DRAM subsystem that is 10 times faster. Um, so as far as other limitations go, everyone knows FPGAs are relatively resource limited. If you want to uh, prototype a large chip, you need many, many FPGAs. And of course, using FPGAs is difficult. Um, if you're going to build a prototype, you need all of the RTL. And then if you want to iterate on that prototype, you need to modify it, and then you have to debug it. And this is all significantly more difficult than just hacking on like a software simulator. And so as a result, FPGA prototypes aren't really used at all in academic research. So in this slide, I'm gonna try and talk about some of the key um, things that I think were discovered and published in RAMP. Um, and firstly, uh, if you look at a lot of the, the cool RAMP um, simulators, a lot of them began as uh, by taking the target and um, decoupling it from the host by describing it as a data flow graph. Um, and so these graphs have three primary constituents. Um, they have tokens, which sort of represent the values on the wires at the end of a cycle. And so this one cycle 
one token per cycle, and these are the messages of the graph. Then there are models, which are the nodes of the graph, and these consume tokens for these new output tokens, and this is how simulation time advances. And then you have channels, which move uh, tokens between the various models. Um, and what's cool about this is that it's a completely closed system. Um, the target behavior is defined independent of the host, and it's determined, obviously deterministically so. So if you correctly host this graph, you can port it across different FPGAs, and whatever, it will continue to be faithful to the target you're trying to model. And the final thing I'd like to highlight is a lot of the ramp simulators, um, inst so instead of taking ASIC RTL and synthesize it, synthesizing it, they wrote very detailed but abstract RTL models that explicitly acted on these tokens. And so I'm calling them abstract RTL models. Um, and in order to really maximize the area efficiency, so in order to simulate, you know, 64 spark cores on a very small FPGA, uh, they had to rely extensively on optimizations such as multi-threading. Um, but the result of that was it made it really difficult to build these models. In fact, uh, famously, uh, it's been said that it's more difficult to write one of these models than to actually build an implementation. So what Midas is going to do differently than RAMP is we're going to try not to write these abstract FPGA hosted models. We're going to try to generate bit exact models from RTL that would be taped out. And we're gonna write, you know, tape out RTL and chisel generators so, you know, we can, do, we can do our design space exploration and thus our simulator reconfiguration simply by generating a different instance. And where Midas comes into play is we're going to try and do this host decoupling, so the modification of the target RTL into something that can uh, accept and produce tokens, as well as some of these area optimizations as fertile transformations. And so we'll get a model that is faithful to the source RTL, does not need to be validated, but can still give you a lot of the benefits of you know, some of the techniques that, uh, talked about in the RAM project. The second big thing is we're not gonna build custom FPGA host platforms, we're going to use FPGAs in the cloud. And over the past 12 years or so, uh, we've been the beneficiary of a number of key technology changes which should make this easier to do than, you know, the ramp time. Um, firstly, we have a lot more open IP now based around RISC V. So we can take rocket ship and boom and we can build models from them automatically. We have very large FPGAs in the cloud, you know, through AWS F F1, for instance. And, you know, 12 years has produced, you know, continued FPGA capacity scaling. So we don't need to resort to the same level of optimization to model the same sort of system. And so in the Midas universe, we need to sort of reevaluate this uh, graph, where now we're going to replace this processor model with a model that's been generated from rocket chip generated RTL. And so the way Midas works at a high level is first, you generate the turtle that represents your target, and that's the source RTL, and you're going to pass it to the compiler and it's going to decouple it, basically transform it into a model that can consume and produce tokens. It can then be instrumented to improve its debuggability, after which uh, Midas goes through simulation mapping, during which it re-invokes Chisel to generate a wrapper, and in that wrapper we implement all of the simulation token channels. This happens once more, we re-invoke Chisel to generate another wrapper, and here we generate all of the abstract RTL models um, we bind all the various simulation components to host DRAM, and we generate a simulation memory bus that, or rather a simulation control bus that allows us to reconfigure all the models in the system. And at the end of all this, you get a Verilog file that you can compile into your FPGA shell project, and a, a header which describes the memory map of the system, and you link that into your driver with the software libraries as well as your software models. And that's the software hosted part. And, um, the whole thing hosted looks something like this. This is on AWS, but basically you have a driver living on your host CPU with your software models that's controlling the simulator, and then all of the RTL models are obviously hosted um, on the FPGA, and you can see the simulation control bus. This is how software essentially interacts with the simulator and allows you to reconfigure the simulator to explore a different point in the design space without having to recompile the bitstream. Okay, so Midas is a fertile based compiler, first and foremost, and a chisel library. It is not standalone, so if you want to use Midas, the best way to do that is to clone FireSim, uh, which is a complete environment using Midas, but pulling in a bunch of stuff from Rocket Chip and Fertile, for instance. Um, so if you want to learn how these two fit together, you should come to our FireSim intensive tomorrow at 2.30. But I have two minutes, so I'm gonna quickly go over some features of Midas that might encourage you to check out FireSim. Um, firstly, we provide a bunch of very detailed 
highly reconfigurable uh, DRAM models um, in Midas. And so the notion here is we're going to try and solve that DRAM modeling problem that I brought up earlier by writing abstract models, yes, in Chisel though, that um, split, timing of, split the timing of functional models, as was done often in RAMP, but expresses the timing model as target time RTL. And so the notion here is, if you're writing a very detailed timing model, um, say, a D, of a DRAM subsystem, what you end up writing looks a lot like a GDR controller, because you need to track all of the bank states and all the rank states, and you're going to write basically a memory access scheduler. And on top of that, it needs to be reconfigurable. So instead of having to worry about host time and managing tokens, you write it as though you're writing a DDR controller, and then you transform it using the same transformations that we're applying to the target RTL. And in the future, when we have optimizations, you can also apply that to um, the timing model RTL. And this allowed us to write very detailed memory models um, of multi-rank DDR3 memory systems that are sort of comparable to DRAM SIM2. And we also provide a last-level cache model that will allow you to uh, model last-level caches that would be much too large to fit in Fabric. Uh, we've implemented like one gigabyte caches just for jokes, <laughs> for instance. Um, these things are highly reconfigurable. They expose upwards of 40 different uh, programmable registers, which allow you to explore a wide design space without having to recompile the simulator. Um, and there's no simulation performance overhead if the target subsystem that you're trying to model is slower than the host. Um, so I'm running out of time, but um, another cool feature is dessert, which is attacking this debugability challenge with FPGA prototypes and FPGA accelerated simulators. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to run two different simulations in parallel with one leading uh, a lagging slave instance. And in the leading instance, we're going to catch a bug. And in the lagging instance, we're going to uh, get a state snapshot of the failing target, say k cycles before it actually fails, and then we're going to replay it in VCS. And that will give you a full visibility waveform of the failing target. And we can detect bugs by either synthesizing assertions, which there are ubiquitous in chisel generated RTL, at least in rocket ship and boom. Um, and then we can also synthesize prints, will allow us to do uh, sort of uh, commit log comparisons, for instance, of rocket's commit log versus spike. Um, and so if I want you to come away with one thing today, it's that Midas is a furl based compiler that lives at the heart of FireSim. Uh, you should come to our intensive tomorrow if you want to learn more. Questions? <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> do we have any questions? Um, I do have one. So you mentioned that you have uh, your models uh, connected by queues of tokens. Um, what happens if within one model or within one design I have multiple clock domains? Yeah, we can't handle multi clock right now. <laughs> but we're working on it. So I hope to have a more interesting story for you in like six months. Any other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker.